Aloha. Hello, everyone. Hello. From around the world. Yeah. Many time zones. Good to see you all. Nice to see some folks who are with us on retreat last week and now back into your daily lives and some new faces, some regulars from the Sunday sitting. Don't forget to, um, if you want to, just um, say hi to everybody on the other pages. See who's here. It's really nice, yeah. Connecting, connecting on Zoom. Great to see you. From seven in the morning in Thailand to seven at night in the East Coast. It's pretty good time change. <laughs> From dark to dark. Wow, great. Wherever you are, you have six senses. Most of us, maybe not all working at the same level, but we have the capacity to have the knowing of sights, sounds, fragrances, tastes. What do you notice in the body? What sensations are clear and streaming alongside of the knowing awareness that happens because of sensations arising, streaming, disappearing, and the thought formations, emotion, mind states of clarity or confusion, wisdom, bewilderment, noticing just as they are. Mindfulness doesn't have a goal or agenda. It arises because there's phenomena to be mindful of in the body and feeling tone, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral feeling tone. With regard to the physical senses and the heart, mind door. So no matter what arises, one way, one lens to view them is the momentary nature of pleasant, pleasing sensations, sights, sounds, mental states, or unpleasant.
are neither pleasant or unpleasant, just a even, even minded equipoise of nature appearing and vanishing. So feeling tones can be the, a portal to seeing reality, the nature of things as they are. It, so it makes daily life, it can make daily life opportunity for wisdom to arise. not just in retreat time. You can see this nature, whatever arises, falls away, whatever appears, disappears. Attunement to this flow of nature of the body stream, the mind stream, the senses. And particularly tuning into what is noticeable in the present moment. And if there's mental thoughts or reflections, one of the wise considerations is that in meditation, thinking is in support of the practice of meditation, of seeing clearly. So rather than dismissing all of the thoughts to see where they're helpful, where their wise attention or wise consideration, wise reflection, and where they carry the mind off into a narrative that we identify and attach to. And just seeing how that falls away and we just notice the mind door as the nature of thought formations and reflection and the knowing mind itself, consciousness itself that is so fleeting, nearly impossible to grab a clear nano moment of consciousness. We usually catch the series of them passing away, the knowing of sounds disappearing of thoughts, body sensations. And to feel more intimately, particular mind states, strong mind states are emotion. To see where in the body there are correlating sensations that reflect a particular mental mood or emotion, a patch of pressure or tingling somewhere or tightness or subtle vibrations, the heat or coolness, sometimes exploring arising and peering and a disappearing mental states or emotions because they're changing moment to moment. It's different sensations in the body or different areas in the body that those correlating sensations arise. This also is a portal to seeing the changing nature, not identifying not self-referencing mental or physical phenomena, just they're following their own nature. 
and the ability to abide in the knowing mind that just sees, senses, feels a feeling tone, a mental formation, a thought formation. And those phenomena that are sometimes are unsettling or seem to derail, as soon as there's mindfulness of it, everything changes. Then it's just what it is, a, a previously disruptive or disturbing mental mood or physical sensation. perhaps no longer derailing or disruptive, just what it is, tightness, tension, contraction, vibration, energy, flow, weighty mental mood, light, fluid mental mood. And noticing the difference when there's just the pure mindful presence. And what is accompanying that mindful presence? If it's a metta mood or compassion, the quality feels expansive. Mind heart quality feels like light opening. Others may feel like there's a negative attitude or like just something in the periphery of consciousness that's nagging or pulling. And that can be a condition to just relax more and scan the body and see if we can connect with that, even if it's amorphous or ambiguous through the body, through sensations in the body. There's no struggle to need to clarify or bring into more light or focus some of the peripheral phenomena that just by their nature remain ambiguous, amorphous phenomena. And always we have the home anchor to come back to, feeling the body from within the body, feeling the breath breathe itself, Sometimes helpful to clearly make our physical head the object of mindfulness. It often releases the self referencing of the habit of. That thoughts originate in the head. Instead, it's just this sensation at the top of the body. And relating more to the solar plexus area as the as the seat of chitta heart, mind, knowing. And there's a relationship between the solar plexus and the head to 
the neuronal system, vascular system. But it feels like a release, an unbinding to not associate the head as as a central part of our experience. Rather the whole system of body, mind. And the various centers that include the solar plexus area and abdominal area. So much of our experience is arising from these energy areas, energy centers of our systems. And somehow the knowing mind just touching barely without needing to figure anything out. Relaxes, releases any tightness, any tension in the mind stream. And then we can actually call up complementary qualities with the stream of awareness, like metta. that expands and lightens and has the intention of goodwill, friendliness, or the care of compassion. The empathetic connection of mudita, And so valuable, such a jewel, the evenness, even-mindedness, the non-reactive, upeka, equanimity that has a profound soothing effect on both body and mind stream. Just present in the midst of things as they are not needing to get anything, get rid of anything. And see for yourself what's true.
Thank you, Stephen. As uh, many of you know, whether you're here or were on retreat with us last week, or you've just seen on the news, <clears throat> there's a an eruption uh, happening here on this island um, of the Mauna Loa volcano, which just started uh, last week, and it's you know very. Um, very powerful, really amazing thing to to be here during this time and to witness and to yeah be able to be in relationship with the event and the mountain and the the eruption itself, but also just you know the social reality and dynamic and kind of excitement you know and awe and wonder and reverence you know that's rippling out you know through through the island and 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 i think even across the islands you know the other places so the other islands are aware of it and can see it in some places i saw yesterday from the beach in makapu'u and uh, oahu that you can see this red glow at night you know far in the distance the clouds lit up so it's really um, amazing the morning it started so i guess i don't know monday night i think and i was already asleep and i woke up to a text message saying that it had, it had happened so i had to get up for the walking meditation you know, it started at six o'clock and i was so i was, got, I was up at five and decided to walk to the just top of the hill here to see if i could see anything i don't know how many miles away we are here but probably at least 50 or 60 miles away, you know, it's, it's that, there's no situation under which it would be a, you know, direct threat to, to this area. And as I was walking up the hill, I could see this red glow in the sky, you know, too early for the sunrise. And it was amazing to kind of come up over the the, the hill and um, look out onto a view that I see every day, you know, taking a walk in the morning or evening and and just to see this stream of lava flowing down the mountain and this glowing uh, fissure, you know, where it was coming out of. And it is just an incredible mix of, um, you know, awe and excitement and appreciation, beauty, wonder, you know, dazzlement, but also a real, just felt like kind of primal terror, you know, to look out and to have some sense of what was happening. And to just feel like this should not be, this is not what's just supposed to happen. You know, the mountain should not be melting. And that really probably, I should, you know, run. <laughs> um, not even that conscious, you know, those are words that I'm putting on it. But something very basic of, of like, and fundamental, you know, in terms of instability and, and seeing something that feels so familiar so transformed um, out of the blue, you know, unexpectedly. And the impact of that and the power of that and the, you know, all of these emotions that kind of came through, it's really remarkable. And so, you know, the, and then a, a few, a few days after that, that, you know, the retreat ended and then, um, people were starting to go and visit and check it out more closely, you know, and it was not so far from a highway that connects the east and west sides of the island. So uh, Michelle and I decided to set our alarm clocks at very, very early at three in the morning and trek an hour uh, to 
in the car, you know, to go, um, to go visit, you know, try to get there while it's still dark and hopefully before the traffic was really bad because you basically have a situation now which is like thousands and thousands of cars are there parked and trying to observe it and witness it and, you know, appreciate it. So it's, it's wonderful, you know, on one hand, and I think it's, there's like a lot of traffic at times, you know, and so we got there, you know, around four and, um, just sort of progressively and as you get closer you catch these views of it you know closer and closer and then they they have a new road off of the main highway that people can kind of go down and it's about five miles and you get really great views but also it's safer you know than kind of just parking on the highway which people were doing and just um kind of more you know of the same really indescribable the sense of unfathomability of it, you know. I have a few pictures I can show you that I took while I was there. I have a camera now that uh, I got a few years ago that can, you know, you can have these longer exposures. So you see a little more, I can capture a little more detail. The stars. This is just a car, cars were driving by at times so you can see the, the terrain, you know, of the old lava flows there, ah, ah, ah flows. And the sun's starting to, a little bit of blue in the sky. It's kind of coming down and forming a lake now on this sort of flatter area. And it's not, you know, threatening any um, residents or developed areas at this point. The, the concern will be eventually that it might hit the road, which would be a problem, but the sense that it's happening in this really kind of safe place for everyone is wonderful. And so you can see it's like when we first got up there, this, it, it just wasn't clear. Like it's, it's also, it was pitch black out, you know, you could see the stars, but besides that, there wasn't a sense of being able to um, put it in a lot of context of your surroundings. And so it was almost just this abstraction, you know, fire, moving fire through space. You know, and slowly as light kind of started to come, you could see the mountain behind it and see the other, you know, kind of landmarks that, that put it into context. But there, is, there was something, um, the, the magnitude of it, of like not knowing what to do with the mind that I experienced, you know, just the sense of well, <laughs> what should, should I be doing something, you know? Um, and this, at some point it's like, oh, well, you know, maybe Meta, you know, for Pele, the goddess, you know, the deity of the mountain. And it was such a quick, like rejection of that, like how ridiculous, like how arrogant that seemed, you know? the sense of like, shut up, <laughs> you know, like you'd see the, the mountain, like, you know, it's like this huge thing. It's like, you're like, get out of here with that. You know, just like, just behold this, you know, and don't even try to fathom what's going on. It felt more appropriate, you know. And then, yes, you know, as the light came back and a little more context, a little bit more of sense of being able to, you know, put a framework on it and understand. And of course, there's all these geologists and scientists and doing all these measurements. And you can learn about all aspects of it in very interesting ways. But it's, it's, it's powerful to have both sides of it, you know, the conceptual framework, the, the experiential sort of location of it and the the non-conceptual just sort of 
impression and transmission, you know, of this event and of this force and of this reality. And then to, you know, come down the mountain and just have it be a regular day, you know, come back home and it's just, everything's normal, you know, and there's this, there's something so strange about that experience of coming back and feeling like things are not normal. Like there's this crazy thing happening over there, but it's like, okay, well, make breakfast and whatever, you know, get to work, do things. Mm. And it had that feeling of, you know, just like the that sense of like the, you know, people coming off of retreat, you know, we had just got, finished this online retreat and, and some piece of what that can feel like, you know, when you, you go through this incredible, sometimes hard to conceptualize or evaluate, you know, experience of being a yogi. And, and then you're just kind of back home, even though, of course, most people are already home, you know, as, as, on your self retreats, but something about the mundaneness of our daily lives and the profundity of what we also know to be true at the same time, though maybe not always in our direct experience in the moment. Um, yeah, it just really resonated with me in terms of like kind of coming off of retreat and and what we had some folks had talked about on retreat around death and around you know kind of like these these moments of our lives whether it's our own mortality or the death or the birth of others, you know, and being a part of these very powerful experiences. And then in some ways have they're so overwhelming and sometimes even unpleasant, painful. But that there is a purity of the intensity of it. And then kind of coming back into the more mundane day to day can still be very hard, you know, even from, if we're exhausted from, you know, caretaking after a death or a birth or, you know, some other pivotal life moment. How powerful that is. And, and then on Saturday morning, I, um, I offered a, a spoon carving workshop down at the, the, with the group of folks that I, you know, paddle with in the mornings something I've been doing. Some of some folks here have taken spoon carving, online spoon carving classes with me, which has been fun over the past couple of years. And um, this is the first time I have done something in person in a while. And the first time anything here kind of in my own community. So it was really fun. Um, good, good way to sort of spend a day and doing them as sort of fundraisers for uh, nonprofits, you know, community groups. And, um, and there's something, you know, most of the time people who are learning this craft, you know, don't have a lot of experience um, creating, you know, with their hands or working with their hands or using these tools, you know, their knives, mostly, you know, that people are using straight knives and curved knives. And so there's a learning process, you know, and we tried to use the kind of softest wood we could find around here and the, make it possible to carve a spoon in a day and it's just very beautiful you know to see people willing to jump in and understand that there's something amazing about working together and um, trying to learn something that's hard and mildly dangerous <laughs> or at least intimidating you know um, and to be humble and to try and to be frustrated and, um, and you know, you look at this block of wood and you've maybe even drawn a spoon into it, but sometimes it's still very hard to see it and know what you're supposed to do. You know, how, what needs to be moved? Like where does it need to get cut? Where does material need to move? How do I make this shape that I can kind of see in my head, but I, you don't quite see how this little club that's in front of you, you know, is going to turn into that thing. And, um, and of course, you know, in that process of carving and learning, you always have some injuries, you know, and um, a few, it was like maybe like five people, you know, out of about 20, you know, had little cut themselves, you know, during the process and nothing major, you know, no, 
Um, nothing big. There's these little nicks, you know, that would kind of happen. People were getting very enthusiastic or trying to use too much force and then it kind of going beyond it or just not knowing kind of really where to position their hands in relationship to the movement of the blade, you know, and, um, and, and, um, I had never, you know, I, I, this has happened, of course, in other spoon carving classes I've led, and I've never really recognized how powerful this moment is when someone cuts themselves, and then we, you know, put down their things, and we go over to the side, and go to the first aid kit, and the sink, and they clean themselves up, and um, yeah, I get to play, like, nurse, you know, for a few minutes, and you know, we put pressure and we uh, get out the Neosporin and get out the Band-Aids and I wrap a little Band-Aid around their finger. And there's something very, so intimate, you know, about these moments of being wounded in something that you are trying so earnestly to do and to be careful with. And you, of course, the many ways that people come to that moment and whether they're sort of embarrassed and feel like they have to explain why they cut themselves or um, uh, uh, or they're just nervous, you know, and or they're nervous and they're pretending not to be nervous or, you know, it's like the smallest little, because it's, because this, because it's like you, th this all happens and you look and there's this like, it's like this little volcano, you know, this little lava flow. And so to like, you know, clean it and wrap it and care for it and just like the sense of um, tenderness, you know, of really recognizing that with kind of every um, eruption of emotion, you know, or in our bodies or on our planets, there's often an injury, you know, that's there and that we do our best to kind of take care of the, and, you know, protect ourselves and protect each other uh, from the eruptivity of the phenomena. Um, but also that how important it is to care for the injury, you know, the, 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 whether it's the physical injury or the emotional injury, you know, that is the cause of it and to tend to it and to um, honor it you know, as like, even if it's just the slightest little cut, um, that there's something sacred in this and something very powerful. And I think that it's, it becomes very clear uh, carving spoons. And, and I think it has to do with people um, being, learning something new and learning and in an experience where they feel like um, a little out of their element, a little disoriented. And the, the shock, you know, of seeing your own blood, um, whether, you know, there was like a 13-year-old kid and a 75-year-old woman and a, a you know, middle-aged guy and kind of people all in between of the kind of humanity of it and the vulnerability of this, of this moment and how, um, how powerful that is. And, and of course, seeing that there are ways in which that's partly what we do when we're teaching as well, you know, that we're helping people explore the, this unknown terrain or unfamiliar terrain and yogis are, you know, practicing and, and sometimes we get injured, you know, or we encounter old injuries or we um, have these eruptions, you know, that happen and you come to interview or questions and answers and there's a little bit of that same sort of role of just like, oh God, like caring, you know, for this wound and um, attending to it and then, you know, sending you back out to keep carving, you know, and <laughs> keep getting in there, keep learning and how beautiful that is, you know, what a powerful uh, trust and, and sense of connection there is in that, you know, how wonderful it is and how important you know, and I think that it's it sort of helped me get a little bit of a sense of, again, not to be presumptuous with, with a deity, you know, but 
that sense of like when we recognize that if there's an eruption and Pele is known as, you know, so passionate and, uh, and in all of the ways that we think of as fire and, um, and, and, and some expressions of that are like a real rage, you know, and real anger. And, and, um, you know, Michelle has spoken, you know, on that sometimes of being able to kind of like a validation of some of that experience internally. And, and this sense, you know, feeling like this through these wounds and through the cut, like of just that, that's also that sense of, of really recognizing whether it's the cuts or our emotional eruptions or our anger or grief or sadness, you know, to recognize that, that usually they are coming out of a place of injury, you know, physical injury, psychic injury, both you know, the emotional sense of loss or being joined with the unpleasant and how powerful that is, you know, how powerful it is to, and important it is to honor, you know, in our own hearts and minds when these eruptions happen, um, to honor that place of woundedness that they're trying to defend or that they're kind of built up pressure over time um, from certain injuries that, that we repress and keep down and, and then kind of explode, you know, at different times, or maybe when it feels more safe or when the pressure can't be contained. And, um, you know, how do we relate to that in our, in ourselves and in one another? You know, is there a place of recognizing the woundedness and the, in any, in any anger, you know, in any aggression and any aversion and any grief, of course, sadness, even longing and lust, right? These things, it's like that there is a, sometimes a hole, an emptiness, a, a longing that can be the source of some of these, you know, fires and eruptions in us. And, I, you know, a little bit of ability to feel like, oh, okay, maybe there is a sense of connection then with the mountain, right? Of, And this being and this, this, this persona and this, you know, archetypal force of, of understanding. Yes, of course. And Pele was wronged, and you know, took things personally, and you know, had hard times. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's reasons for this rage and 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 for the fire. And is there an entry point around kind of compassion there that that feels appropriate? You know, that feels still odd and respectful and. Uh, unfathomable, but at the same time, maybe a little bit of a sense of that there's a symmetry in that these levels of eruptivity, the physical, the emotional, the um, cosmological, you know. And I'll just lastly, I, and it was it kind of amidst all of this, I, you know, I had a, a, a radio show. I have a radio show at a local, you know, little radio station. And um, this morning as I was driving up, I was um, kind of going through my playlist and trying to make sure that the sequence made sense. And uh, in honor of the eruption, I was doing all songs that had to do with fire and volcanoes and um, and there was, there was a song by this artist Adele that I, I put on, and um, I'm not, I, I'm not like a huge Adele fan. Um, I think she's like incredibly talented, you know, amazing in all of these ways. But it's never been. I don't like you know put her music on for the most part. But my dad loved Adele, and. It was just, it was this sort of funny thing, you know, towards the end of his life. He passed away about 10 years ago where I, um, we agreed on so much, you know, uh, music and film and things like that. And so it was always funny when there was something that like, I just didn't connect with as much, you know, that he really liked or vice versa, you know? Um, and, and so I have this association, God. He also like, and this is hard, tricky time, Christmas time. He liked, God, what's that guy's name? Groban, Jeff Groban. He's like that. Anyway, he sings these 
in my view, sort of corny songs, but there, but there, he loves these Christmas songs that are like you start to hear on the radio, you know. I don't think I'm gonna jump into my listening to him anytime soon, but uh, but you know, he also very talented, has a great voice, and my dad loved him, and um, you know, I don't know, the man who taught me to love the Beatles and Bob Dylan and. <laughs> All these artists I do love. I was like, I don't know. Anyways, so Adele comes on, and I just start sobbing on the ride up to the my radio show. And it was just so amazing to have this kind of eruption happen um, because it reminded me of this. Like, it was like, of course I love my dad, and of course I miss my dad. And, but I've... I've gone through a lot of grief and grieving process around him. And I don't feel on a day-to-day -day level, I don't feel a lot of sadness about him being gone at this point. You know, I, I did, you know, and I had plenty of sobbing and plenty of crying, you know, when he first passed away. And for several years, you know, it was a very powerful experience for me, of course. And, um, and so to have this just like immediate kind of like uh, almost seeming like sort of signless, you know, uh, emotion well up listening <laughs> to Adele, right? Uh, it was very powerful, you know, it was really wonderful. Uh, and, I, and I do feel like that there is something around the eruption happening in a kind of external way that has felt like a little bit of a relief and i and i feel it for myself but i also feel like there's something palpable um around us where you know we're living in a time that's like so tense and everyone's like there's so much pressure and there's so much foreboding and the sense of all the badness that's going to happen and all the badness that is happening and, um and I think there's a quite a way that it's like very hard to process that through every day, that it builds up, it builds up, it builds up in this tension. And there is something very powerful to have this eruption happen, where of course at first people were very terrified and worried that it was going to come into a community and people would have to, you know, their lives would be turned around and, you know, a lot of upheaval but that it's happening in the safety right that it's happening in a safe place where no one actually is threatened i feel like there's a way in which more broadly there is a feeling that like we have ex been able to experience something very volatile but in a safe container and that that has felt healing and and a sense of relief and and a kind of sense of opening for you know i'll say my heart body um, but I, I do have a sense of it maybe more generally than that. And, and that it's very moving. And, and I think that there, the thing about the practice is that it does, it allows for this kind of thing, whether it's on retreat in a more intensive way or just, you know, in our daily sitting, daily life practice, the sense of being able to allow for eruptions to happen in a context that's safe, right? In a context where it's, it's not going to do damage. We're not going to harm other people or ourselves. It's not going to, it's not going to create actual suffering, but that there is an honesty to it. There's a, uh, an opening for the ability to feel through things that would otherwise feel really dangerous or might, if we weren't in the context of our practice, might, end up in speech that was harmful to ourselves speech that, or to others that we might regret physical acts that are harmful to ourselves or others and um how wonderful to be able to give ourselves the space and time and protective container of retreats or of our daily practice um to be able to go through these kind of experiences of building pressure and eruptivity in a in the safety where we can learn from it, where we can be awed by it, where we can be aware of the tenderness, you know, in our hearts and aware of the the injury that might be at the heart of them and be able to provide and and offer a sense of tenderness and compassion and caring and nursing, you know, to ourselves around these wounds. Um so you know, I know I can't we can't offer eruptions and safe eruptions in every town and 
every part of the world for everyone to, you know, kind of have this experience. But I think that's, it, it is a lot of the, the point of the practice, you know, um, where we can explore this terrain in very powerful and literal and direct ways. And to, to value that, you know, when it comes up that like when we have a hard time in our practice and something's very difficult that it's not like we're bad yogis or that we've, you know, done something wrong or, or are lost, you know, beyond redemption, right? But rather that it's like, yeah, this is the point of practice, right? To create a safe learning environment to be able to experience these things and come to our edges and, and see when we do, you know, have these, this volatility and this sensitivity and this tenderness, you know, at the heart of our, out of our heart of ourselves, it gets to be exposed and it gets to be shown and that it is an opportunity for us to, to be um, moved, you know, by the, the reality of it, the magnitude of it, the power of it. And the vulnerability of it, the tenderness of it, the preciousness, you know, of it. And of course, wherever we can to see that this is what is happening for everyone, you know, in their lives and all beings in all forms. It's like going through um, these lives and these periods of growing pressure and injury and hardship into, you know, emotion and expression and um, the beauty of that and the poignancy of that and that we are building the tools to be able to go through that skillfully, wisely, with care. Mm. So that is uh, all for the talk for today. And um, as usual, we have some time for questions if anyone has any to help with your practice um, as usual the little reactions button on the bottom of the screen is you can click on and raise your zoom hand and we'll know you have a question and if you can't find it you can leave a note in the chat that you have a question or wave your real hands around and we'll try to see it Hi, Suzanne. Oh, let me, there we go. You should be able to unmute yourself. Hi, thank you so much for these weekly sits. Um, I started doing something different with my practice about 10 days ago. It wasn't on purpose. It was just kind of responding to chaotic conditions in my practice. Um, with every in-breath and every out-breath, directing my attention to my heart center, I make this little note, no control, no control. Um, and then I'm able to return to my body again. My, my thoughts have been so obsessive and I've been so identified with a set of unpleasant thoughts that I'm completely lost in my practice. I'm hardly present. And so it's kind of spontaneously, I just started doing this practice, just no control, no control. And I, I don't know, maybe it's like an equanimity practice, but it, it's, it seems to bring me into my body again and to help a bit with that, um, kind of just getting so over-identified with really unpleasant thoughts, kind of like planning, strategizing, worrying kind of thoughts. And so if you have any, um, guidance around that, it would be really helpful. Steve, you want to start? I can start. At the beginning of the instruction, I, I mentioned something about wise reflection and the use of our thoughts for meditation purposes. In the Buddhist teachings, uh, yoniso manasakara is, are the two Pali terms that mean wise consideration, wise attention, wise reflection. And so that's what I was hearing 
uh, Suzanne, when you were describing what you were doing, that you're we're using our th thoughts for their very best use, the meditative mind, the aware mind, and ways to do what you just described, find that you there's more of a connection from within the body, of the body and all of your experience, more grounded and uh, less vulnerable to spinning off or identification with a, a narrative about it. So uh, to me, that seems like you're, that's right on, that's, that's in tune with your practice. And it's a skillful means use, upaya use of, of our thinking mind. Thank you so much for that, Steve. Yeah. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Yeah, I, I, well, I know I totally agree. And I, I might just add that you have no idea, you know, how long this will last as a tool that, that kind of works, you know, and to don't, you know, you, you don't need to have an expectation of that either. You know, it could be that this ends up working for you for your whole life, you know, and it could be that in a couple of weeks, there's, you know, something else that feels the connection, you know, helps make that connection. And, um, that it just yeah to, to echo Steve how how important it is to sort of trust the yeah, that we can find a way of bringing something in you know that that's helping us connect and helping us ground and land and be here and and to to explore mm -hmm. and just see what it you know like you said maybe this is equanimity and I could I can imagine that right maybe that there's something in the phrase that to my heart it, it, I have a sense that it could evoke that experience, you know, that feeling and, mm -hmm. and what a lovely phrase, you know, to do that. And the test is really in your own experience of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, st I don't need, I, I mean, I'll, you know, I, I've, I sometimes jog and I really, really don't enjoy it and so I, I i i go through all kinds of like things i try to do <laughs> to see like what might make it like less unpleasant or maybe even useful in terms of my spiritual practice <laughs> i go through phases of finding things that kind of work you know sometimes it's really just trying to be mindful of every sensation and it's harder you know moving that quickly that can be very fruitful. But there was a while where the phrase, and I still do at times, it's not all as kind of predominant, but we're just like unbinding. And sometimes it doesn't have to make sense. And sometimes it, you can find your way of making sense, but the, the notion of unbinding as more of a kind of mantra and a reminder of like not identifying with mind or body is, was that sort of like my, for whatever reason, that notion was, effective and powerful for my heart of that kind of reminder, um, you know, not about kind of dissociating, but also to be very careful about the way, the tendency to kind of what you're saying of like how quickly we can believe certain thoughts and get entangled in certain dynamics, you know, between the mind and body and unbinding was something that, you know, um, was very helpful for me for a while and um, still is there and is part of my toolkit, you know. Thanks so much. It's yeah. it's that's really, really, really helpful. I appreciate it. Yeah, sounds great. And I'm sorry that things feel hard. <laughs> As the they nature do. of samsara. All right, yeah. Rose. Hello. Um Jesse, thanks for sharing this story about your father's grief. That was really touching. Um, so my question is, or actually just um, a little bit of teaching, could you talk about um, turning awareness on awareness and what features to look at? I'm thinking like open versus like fixed, partial versus a little bit more full, like here, or like infused with like a spiritual emotion. Um, and if 
possible or, or helpful, how that would apply to the metaphor of the matchbox, the striker, and the spark. I was going through this the last on the retreat, like, which part is awareness? And I was laughing at myself because I kept bebopping and changing what was what. And my final consideration is it has to do something with like awareness of the spark, making the spark an object itself, and I don't know, the intensity or just the knowing of the spark even. Yeah, that's what I'll say for now. Thanks. Steve, I feel like you're really good at talking about this, but either way. What you're describing, Rose, is um, one of the four foundations of mindfulness. When we talk about mindfulness of body and mindfulness of feeling, tone, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. That is um, in the Buddhist discourse on on mindfulness, sati, patana, sutta, uh, starting with the body or breath makes sense because it's immediate and it's grounding. It's like working with elementally, earth, water, fire, you know, the heat element, air, pressure, vibration, and so forth. And then feelings and all the other four foundations are to do with the mind. Pleasant, unpleasant, neutral feeling tone are mental. And then the third foundation is what you're really talking about. It's a mindfulness of, of chitta, the mind, consciousness, thought formations, anything to do with the, the knowing faculty that's arising and passing moment to moment. Uh, and, and the fourth is basically an elaboration of that, of mental experience. Um, so your, your sense, and sensitivity are are right in turning awareness on itself. What what you are what you are likely to find at first, and then as you grow more relaxed in doing that practice, is how swiftly uh, moments of awareness are passing away. And, and you know, when we turn awareness back on itself, what we are aware aware of is. It's just the stream, really, of aware moments. It's a little bit of reflection when we realize that there was awareness and an object that arose together and then fell away together. Like, for example, when we're aware of the rising movement of the abdomen, if we use the abdomen area, abdominal area, as an anchor, home anchor, what we're noticing when the mind is very relaxed and very quiet is the sensation, maybe a, a cycle of sensations of pressure and propelling and, and increasing intensity and tightness and so forth as the abdominal wall fills up. And moments of that, little segments of where we see these series of cycling sensations and then the moment of awareness that comes with it and the two of them falling away. So if we use wise reflection, like after a segment of sitting for some seconds or minutes, or maybe toward the end of the sitting, we reflect back, well, what are we actually noticing? Well, we're noticing pressure and the awareness of pressure fall away. We're noticing you know, heat or vibration, or tension and the awareness of that heat, vibration, and tension fall away. I mean, that's how quickly things are arising and passing. So when we turn awareness on itself, you know, awareness doesn't exist in a vacuum. It has causes and conditions. So it has there's something that oh, mindfulness is aware of in order for it to arise. A sensation, another mental state. Uh, an emotion is a condition for mindfulness to arise and see that emotion, to see that sensation, to see that thought form. And what we're observing, if we reflect on what we've just been observing, 
are, are, the, are the pair falling away, the object of awareness and the awareness. The object of awareness can be a, a sense door phenomena, a sensation, a sound, a sight, or um, our mental phenomena. Thoughts, emotions, are awareness itself, as you, as you brought up as the beginning of your question. So what you're, what you're noticing is a moment of awareness that's noticing the previous moment of awareness as it's, as it's passing away. I often use the metaphor of awareness being like this continually <clears throat> changing mist at the lip of a waterfall. And we're just seeing nature, physical stream of phenomena, mental stream of phenomena, any of the sense doors fall away. And that waterfall is all just disappearing. And like we notice it for a moment. Tail of it or something? Like, Sorry? Like catching tail the of it. tail of it. Is that catching the tail of it. That would be accurate. Okay. Yeah. I have to oh, yeah. practice this for a while. Sorry, I interrupted you. Apologies. That's all right. I was just going to follow on your own metaphor. Yeah. Waves are the same thing. Waves are continually changing. We're not seeing the same wave. But we're just seeing the end of a cycle of force in the ocean that creates the water to come up and disappear. So it's the same as your metaphor of seeing the, the tail end of something. Yeah, you're gonna have to watch that because I've been sort of honing in on it this week and just what you just said, just the object and the awareness. I just feel like it's going to be like this. <laughs> I don't know, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, but thank you. You're welcome. I mean, that's an accurate description of the reality of practice to see things in those pairs, because there is no awareness without something to be aware of. And we're not doing anything to make anything happen. Light is just streaming in our body, sounds stream into our body, fragrances stream into our body, and thoughts arise you know, from the mind center. So that, that work is already done. And just paying attention, being relaxed, present, and let the mind open, then we see how it happens in pairs, the phenomena and the awareness of that phenomena, the light stream or the sound vibration and the awareness of that sound vibration falling away. Listening to music, we're hearing the end of music and then the silences between the musical notes. You know, and beautiful mu music is a combination of an artist. Music for me. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Ha ha ha. The master plan. <laughs> D disenchantment. <laughs> I don't want to take too much time. Now, I feel like I'm going to pull away with there's a pair, there's a duality, and there's also a non duality because they're connected. Right? Something like that. I mean, I think to just. Re and re-emphasize with some of what Steve is saying or if just a few points of like part of it is just rec we tend to sometimes think of it spatially like there's a thought and then there's like this observer sort of you know here and really what's the recommendation and the encouragement of this particular approach and the framework is to not think of it so much spatially as just temporally like sequentially and so that it is the mind in this is the striker, the receptor, and the ignition, but it's just different moments of mind, right? That are uh, that 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 have the recognition of the previous moment, and so it's um, you know just that the 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 sense, the just you know the, the 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 softness actually that's needed, and the not getting too tight around it because it's happening so fast. It actually requires kind of relaxing the mind. Um, and that it's very subtle and very hard to see and and of course confusing um and then you just note oh that's confusion right you'd recognize that's another moment of experience and you just keep trying to stay with the 
present moment, which is so fleeting, you know, and, and where do you have the sense of just watching the, the ending of it or, or the beginning or, or what have you. But it is important to, to try this, you know, thing, this, uh, this perspective, as Steve is saying, because it's like, part of what it helps us break down is, but through observation, where are we seeing identification happen? Normally, it's like, oh, we're just identified with our thoughts. And then you start to see that there's like the possibility of being aware of thoughts or aware of awareness. And so you have some traditions that are going to say, oh, well, that's the real me. That's the real I, the self that's great and big and expansive. And, you know, the Buddha was very encouraged of a real... Um, skepticism around that to say like no there's there's this going to be want to be this tendency to identify with this the witness as this non you know this bigger than self self right and that some traditions really offer and and his emphasis and kind of insistence was like no that is also impermanent that's also disappearing and and it's also not self um and that that's something that we can directly observe it's very powerful so important question, yeah. Well, hmm. Steve, Michelle, what do you all think? Shall we call it a day? <laughs> we know it's wild out there, everyone, especially as the holidays get going and people are busy and I hope you find some sanctuary in the quiet of the darkness. Your practice, community. Volcanic Probably. energy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Eruptions of all kinds. Upandita was teaching a retreat on the Big Island when Pele last erupted 38 years ago and being asked questions about her as this mythological being, the fire goddess. He said that she was partly like a deva, a celestial being, you know, cr creating land, creating cre creativity, the power of creativity, all the islands of the Hawaiian archipelago, all the islands in the Pacific, and most of the world uh, from that energy of creativity. And that also that there was this side of her like a yaka. A yaka is a, a deva-like being um, that often is around when we practice it. So it's it said, uh, it can know our thoughts and tries to steer or influence our thoughts toward met the meditative mind. And so in that way, um, but they, but yakas can also be mischievous. 
you know, they, they have the element of the opposite of creativity, a kind of destructive force. So sometimes Pele is like a, a deva in creativity and providing this object of reverence, this being of reverence for, you know, a thousand years or more. And sometimes more like the, the um, mischievous or destructive element. Uh, when I grew up with Pele as this reality, uh, Joseph Campbell said she's the last living goddess on our earth. And, that, and sometimes uh, during eruptions, people who had um, befriended her in the form of either uh, an old woman walking, giving her a ride, or a younger woman uh, also needing a ride from one place to another. And people who, who befriended her, when later there was an eruption, the, the lava would flow around the outline of their land, but not harm their land or their home on the big island. And then if they hadn't, if they didn't befriend her or insulted her in some way, <laughs> the land would disappear. And, you know, there's so many stories that are like that, that showed invited respect for her as this powerful being of creativity and, and destruction and for Polynesia, you know, and Hawaiians in particular with Pele. Um, and Mupandita was so respectful of that, you know, and just brought in through his own Buddhist lens, the mythology of beings on other realms and their capacity to, to be creative or to change, not necessarily be intentionally destructive, but, you know, she did cut off the power to the measuring tool that tells us about the pollution nature of our planet. So temporarily we lost awareness of how polluted, how much carbon is floating around in the, in the outer atmosphere. But that will be repaired if it hasn't already. It's just an anecdote about the respect that, you know, a prominent Buddhist practitioner and scholar, you know, had for the mythology of indigenous Polynesia. Take care, everyone. Have a good week.